lot of times. Autoimmune. Autoimmune. Strep throat. How, did, how does that work? Tell me that. What? Who takes Say it with a trust. One kind is. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Got it. Now, I, now I'm hearing it all. What? Kids. Okay. What else? Knees and elbows. Knees and elbows. So. Yeah. And the. Pardon? What's the part where your hair touches the neck? Is that the nape? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a common place to bleach. Okay. Silvery flax. It can. Sometimes they can. Worse in the winter? Worse in the winter. What happens in pregnancy? It goes away. Oh. Often goes away. Exhalation. Okay. So, what kinds of things do we use to treat it? What you learn about? What? Say what? Using biologics now? Uh, you can, <coughs> yes. Vitamin D. Okay. The sun. Vitamin D. The sun, yes. Steroids. Oh, yeah, tanning. Did you talk about coal or tar? No. Those are old products. They still could be used. They're pretty effective. They're just messy. They stain your clothes. Uh, so the biologics. So you've got oral biologics. You've got the other. So um, did she talk about where biologics fit? Disease changing. What do you mean? Well, remember the biologics have lots of side effects with them, right? So I would think 80 to 80 percent of people have mild to moderate. So your severe is where I think that the biologics fit, uh, or if you have extensive disease. Because if you have mild, then you have, you're not covering much. Of, you don't have many lesions. Did she show you this? Oh, sorry. This about coverage. So mild, less than three percent. So knees, elbows, pretty common. Uh, moderate, then three to ten percent, and then severe being more than ten percent. Okay. Eighty percent of people have mild or moderate. All right. So I think you got most of them. So very common. I've only got pulled a few of the different, but those ones on the knee, the shin, and the elbow are pretty classic. Uh, in terms of their presentation. Okay. So let's look at choice of therapy. You hit some of them. So the decision point is are you going to use topical or are you going to use some type of injectable or oral? So usually what will drive it is how extensive it is. Uh, so again, if you've got mild, then it makes no sense to me to use a biologic. You're, you're giving that you're putting them at too much risk for um, something you can easily treat with a topical product. And I'd say that probably goes for moderate too, but just there it would be depending. Severe, I think that is a is a real good area. Now the other is that how much the, the, the treatment of psoriasis is, is high maintenance. It requires a lot of application of topical products in sequence. And so how often do you want to do that? The biggest reasons why people don't do well with psoriasis therapies is that it's just, it's burdensome. So going with the least burdensome that the person will do uh, is the best. If you can get them under control, then you can go to intermittent therapy. Once you can get their, their skin back to looking normal, then you can back way off. Uh, but if you don't, if you don't continue to treat it, it just comes back. Uh, so that's, those are some of the big things. Uh, it's, the, it's the treatment burden that becomes uh, the bigger barrier. Uh, skin thickness, those, even a very, um, so this plaque is pretty thick, or the one there at the top, compared to the, the one under the, neck, the arm, I guess that is, or the one on the elbow. 
So those thicker ones are harder to treat. They require a lot more topical medicine. So given the extents of that, that might be one to maybe start to consider a biologic. So let's look under mild to moderate disease. So your mainstays still are your steroids, your topical steroids. Most people, and they, they usually treat very well. So top, so the emollients. So what emollients did I tell you about the other day? What are some of the brand names we talked about? What's an emollient? Aquaphor. Aquaphor was one of them. Urea 20%, Aquaphor, Cetaphil, remember those? So you would you, you would put that on first and that will smooth, that will uh, make the, the ability of you to get the uh, steroid to go in much easier. Softens up the skin, makes transport uh, through much easier. So emollients and topical steroids. Some alternatives, so you talked about the vitamin D. Uh, there are, there are two on the market now, the calcipotrienes and the calcitriol. Uh, that calcipotriene has been on the market for a long time. Uh, the calcitriol topical is a little bit newer comer. You can use tar. I'll show you some of, of uh, we'll talk about ways to use that. Um, and then the topical retinoid. So that tazeratine is a, a product that is, has been developed specifically for uh, psoriasis. Other products, we're going to go into these in a little bit more depth in a, in a page or two. Uh, if you're dealing with the face or inner trigenous, you can use these calcineurin products, and that's what the tacrolimus and the picrolimus uh, are. Uh, these are, are uh, immune modulating items uh, or topic, topical products. Okay. This kind of gives you a schematic of a ladder of, of um, treatment. So topicals, then you have phototherapy in the, in the middle. Uh, this used to be a very popular way to treat psoriasis. Uh, from what I've read, it is decreasing in, uh, in popularity. One is because limited people can do it. The other is the worry about skin cancer. The other is the need to become certified, special equipment. Um, so, from what I've read, that has gone down somewhat in the past. Probably systemics are taking over where they you would have used phototherapy in the past. Phototherapy is pretty uh, um, effective, but again, it carries a risk just like the systemics do as well. Um, there's your emollients. Ah, did you watch that little video I said? Anybody watch the four minute video? I can't believe you just said go and watch it. <laughs> okay, anyway, he talks about fingertip dosing, you know, like you're telling people, watch the dose. Okay, so a fingertip. I like this slide because then you've got this little chart and it shows you how many fingertip units it would take to do a surface area. So it might be something, I'm sure you can Google it, get up. Uh, but to keep it around if you're using topicals a lot um, until you get used to it, uh, that might be very helpful. Okay. So looking down at the bottom of page 11, uh, some combination therapy. So using the puppy steroids, which are the more common one used in combination with the vitamin D analogs is a very common treatment. Uh, this little slide shows you uh, the vitamin D analogs by themselves are not very effective, are not as effective as steroids. So what this shows you, I can't see it when I turn around like that. So that green line, you can see the green is the vehicle itself. So that's just using an emollient. And it shows you the mean change duration. Let me go back here. I just can't read it this way. Mean change in I don't know what their what their unit is. I think that was the like the scale of how the patient says it responds. Okay, patient yeah. scale, and then over time is on the x-axis. So the vehicle gives you some response. 
And the next line down the blue is the vitamin D analog. So you see you get a, it's better than the vehicle but with a, a non-treatment. But then the, it's not as good as the, the next one is the black is what a steroid would do. And then the red line is the combination of that therapy. So they're very good together. Um, but probably wouldn't use a vitamin D analog alone for the majority of patients. So if you go down uh, to the uh, bullet uh, next to last, here the, the one thing with psoriasis that I like is you can be pretty inventive. Uh, so you see what they've recommended there is something like a vitamin D. So products that aren't going to cause so much systemic toxicity you can use daily and then use your steroid intermittently once you've got the, the lesions under control. The other is that some people do things like they will take, they'll use certain drugs during the week and then only on the weekend they'll take others. So once they get to a maintenance phase, the, the drug therapy part that is more demanding, they'll move to days that it's easier for them to do. Make sense? It is a, it's unusual. There's very few diseases or conditions where we'll do that. But they're, they're, gear, they're gearing it all towards what can the patient tolerate because it's long term, it's all their life, and what can they work into their schedule that will be effective. And so these seem to work. So intermittent on top of a continuous um, therapy with different agents is, can be done. So the du, uh, Duvobet is that combination of uh, beta methasone and the vitamin D analog. Okay. Top of the next page, uh, adherence, number one problem. Let me show you. So here is a person who used coal tar plus clobetasol. Look at the change in time. I think it was like in eight weeks. So once we get them to normal, we really have to back off the steroid because then they can get a lot more absorption. So early on when you're applying it to that lesion, they don't get that much systemic absorption, but they get a lot of local effect. But as soon as you move it back to normal skin, more normal looking skin, then they're at risk. So that's where you have to move that steroid back to a much um, more uh, intermittent dose. You'd use the same strength, but only once or twice a week. A um, couple of things they point on out there is that they applied both Daily, twice daily for two weeks. So pretty common to get them into remission. Commonly high dose steroid takes about two weeks and then they backed off uh, to the foam twice daily on Mondays and Fridays and the clobetasol twice daily on the weekends. See? So a really inventive. Must have worked for that young man. Uh, I think it was a guy's album that I was reading. So that just gives you a, an idea of some of the um, ways they may design the, the therapy. Here's another woman. She was on, you know, she has a much greater surface area, but she used, um, is this what, yeah, halcyonide, halcyonide. What is that? How long? What uh, potency is that one? Two. Two. Very old, long, been around a long time. <laughs> so this was after 28 days. So they used it longer because of the, the surface area or the amount of space. Those lesions were covering. Dr. Yeah. I have a question about maintenance. So, if you wouldn't start maintenance right because the lesions under control, so right, that maintenance right. gone? Uh, it, the disease is not gone. Yeah. You just have, you got the immune system under control in that area. Yes. So then, when you do the maintenance, you just play, put it the whatever you're putting on yes. the topical way yes. it used to be. Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. Good point. Yeah. Uh -huh. You're just gonna put it over back over that lesion because otherwise it'll come right back. So moderate to severe, so this is more than 5 to 10 percent of the uh, body surface area. Again, this is where phototherapy would come in, but here's where your biologics could start to come in. So look at the different types. There are a ton. Every year I go back, it grows. The drugs that have been around the longest are those anti-TF uh, TNF uh, alpha agents. So you see several that we talked about with UC, right? Mm -hmm. So Humira, Embril, Remicade, Simsia just got the approval uh, for psoriasis.
and I added it into your list. But look at all the others. You've got interleukin 1223, the Stellara. Uh, you've got the antileukin uh, 17A, which is Cosentix, which is must be making a lot of money because they advertise like crazy. So who's the who's the uh, performer that they always have on there? Uh, you all don't know. <laughs> I don't want Cindy. Oh, oh so yeah. Yeah. do you know Cindy Lauper? Yeah. 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 What so Yes, girls, just one. It ought to be your theme song. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't watch cable. We don't watch cable. You don't watch cable. You stream. Yeah. It's cheaper. I watch cable. Much cheaper. <laughs> See, you miss all these commercials about drugs that you would know more if you watched the commercials. <laughs> okay, so Cindy Lauper, you know who she is, the pink hair. Girls just want to have fun. Well, she has psoriasis all over her elbows and arms and upper arms, and so she takes Cosentix, so she's on there. Uh, I believe so. She shows it before and after. Okay, so then the uh, interleukin-17 receptor antibody, the silic, uh, the interleukin-23, trinfia, There'll be more. These are tens of thousands of dollars. So that's why Bethany, or, uh, not Beth, uh, Amanda, when, okay, so the story is, when I was in, in uh, at Texas, there was a very a good student that I worked with for several years, and her name was Bethany. And you remind her just, and so the day that you said your name and I saw you, I have melded those names and I could not get it out of my She was an excellent student, though, so it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I can't believe I can't break, them. break the, the bond. Okay, so these agents, they're just going to continue to grow. I still am concerned. I just don't know. I, I don't know how they, much they will trickle down into broad use. Uh, you know, maybe people are willing to take the risk as we get more comfortable and we understand more about the immune process that takes place. Obviously, there's multiple cytokines that are playing into the development of those psoriatic plaques. Uh, and so they may, over time, find when they can start to get bigger numbers that one's safer or better than another. But they are expensive uh, compared to topical therapy. Expensive. And they're, most of them are injectables. So, I think it'll be determined in your professional life lifespan. Okay, so let's look at treatment based on location. So if you've got intertriginous psoriasis, then you're going to use the lower potency. So there are six and seven. So what's seven? Hydrocortisone. What's six? I always say transcendent. It's a it's a good broad spectrum, and it's it's fairly low potency compared to what's out there now. Here you could use a vitamin D analog, so that calcid, uh, potriene, uh, or the calcineurin inhibitors, dicrolimus or dicrolimus. Those are first line. The problem with these is they are much slower. So your steroids, if you're using with an emollient, high potency. You can get those those plaques to respond pretty fast, like you saw in that picture in eight weeks. Here, if you're using these other products, they don't go as fast. So you'll just you'll have to let the person know. So expectations are big. And I think that once people get into it and or realize that this is the treatment for the rest of my life, that's where you start to put reality with what is reasonable. We see it in diabetes. I mean, we can, with anybody, for the most part, get their blood sugars under control, but it's what it takes then to do it. If you have to take insulin four to five times a day, and you have to check your blood sugar, and all that goes around it, some people may just say, it didn't work it to me. I understand the risk, but it didn't work me live it in my life like this. So it's a similar uh, here with, with psoriasis. Scalp psoriasis. So here, all those, those uh, more unique um, dosage forms of vehicles we talked about play a role here. So this is where the shampoos come in, the lotions come in. Uh, for me, who have very thin hair, it's easy to get the drug down to the scalp. For those of you who has thick, thick hair. Okay, Sarah Beth. 
for us to get, if she has scalp psoriasis, it's much harder for us to get it down to the, the plaque and get it to stay on there. So those mousses have been developed, the shampoos have been developed, you've got lotion, uh, not lotion, solutions uh, that can be used. Uh, so that's where they would come into play. Uh, you can use uh, the uh, anthralin. I'll show you some pictures of those uh, as well. The coal tar shampoo. Uh, anybody ever use those? Yes. Uh, they smell bad. They smell like tar, but they're very effective. You can stand the smell. Uh, so if you look down at the bottom, it also talks about intralesional uh, injections with steroids. That would be if you've got one big lesion and you're having trouble getting drug down, down to it to stay on there. Top of next page. So salicylic acid would be used. What did I tell you its main uh, job is? What does it do? What salicylic acid is it? Okay, exfoliant, we use the term keratolytic. <laughs> so it'll take skin off. Okay, so remember with the wart and the uh, corn, we use a keratolytic. Okay. So this is, they're doing the very same thing. They're using a keratolytic to take off a lot of the, the skin off of a very thick lesion. Again, all the things that we talked about with using it would, would go again with this. And we'll, we'll visit that in just a minute. Phototherapy, systemic agent, still treatment options when you've got um, extensive disease. Okay, from the next few pages we're going to go into more depth with these agents and talk about more uh, administrative um, nuances, I guess. So emollients, so we've talked about those in terms of using those first. Those are the, for the thicker the plaque, the more of the emollient you want. So it hydrates, cracks the skin, would be helped here. Soap should be avoided. Which soap should I tell you are the worst? Dial, Irish Spring, Zest, pardon? Ivory. Okay, so the real alkaline pH soaps. And the better soaps are what? Uh, Dove, uh, Olay, Cetaphil. Okay, so Dove would be a, a good one to recommend. Everybody recognizes that. Skin hydration. So all the things we talked about. Don't use really hot water, pet dry, moisturize after you get out of the, the bath. The topical steroids still um, very similar, bringing back in all those things we talked about uh, a couple of days ago. Cornerstone of treatment, it's good because it does everything we want. It's anti-inflammatory, anti-proliferative, immunosuppressive, vasoconstrictive, yay. All of those categories for steroids are actually done on the vasoconstricting property of the drug. It's really weird. We don't think about steroids so much being vasoconstrictors, but that's how they determine all those, those categories. We're not going to worry about that. <coughs> Choice of vehicle is important. Okay, so here it depends. Scalp versus endotriginous versus face versus the, your elbows and knees. Okay, so we would apply those very same things. Uh, that midsection there, uh, where it goes into hair bear, uh, hair bearing, <laughs> that is not easy to say, hair bearing areas, scalps, the foams, the sprays, just what we talked about. Same thing with skin, we're going to use lower potency, or the face, we're going to use lower potency. Duration of treatment. Well, the duration is always, forever. Uh, how often you have to do it then goes back to remission versus maintenance. Skin atrophy will be a problem, so we want them to stay on the lesion. We want them to keep the drug on the lesion uh, and not on surrounding material or uh, skin. Now, like with that kid that we saw his elbow improve, if we continue to put the steroid on there every day, then he would develop the atrophy and the stria. Uh, the other systemic uh, ADRs could also become a problem for him. Okay. Next page, the topical vitamin D analogs. Again, that calcipotriene has been on the market the longest. Um, there are the different trade names, comes as a variety. It's also referred to more often as calcipotriol. 
But to me, it's, it's, uh, it can be confused with um, um, the other one right off my brain. Um, so again, these are an add-on. It's not as effective. It might be in very mild situations if you're wanting to avoid a steroid, but usually going to be used along with a steroid. Can be used twice a day. Um, let's see. If you go down to the side effects, skin irritation. So anything you put on the skin can aggravate it. Uh, so that's kind of a given. And more expensive than the, the cheapest of the steroids. The calcitriol, that's why I, that's the one. So the calcipo trial and calcitriol, to me, they're too close. So I like to use the other, the other term. Uh, so that Vecta, Vectacal is the trade name of it. They're equally effective. Uh, the other one's been approved in Europe for a long period of time. They just didn't seek approval here. So it's, it's a more newcomer. It's more expensive. However, maybe less irritating on more sensitive parts of the skin. That's kind of what, how they market uh, that drug. So coal tar. This is probably one of the earliest treatments that was used for psoriasis. It's been around forever. It's effective, but it's messy. Uh, and that's probably the, the biggest reason that people have moved away from it. Uh, Dan, we have no, we do not know how it works. So, but we know it's anti-proliferative uh, when we use it. It can be used without a prescription. So people can go into a, a, a pharmacy and, and get that. Um, it will stain, it'll stain anywhere you put it. Um, so like with the shampoos, uh, if you're dealing with a blonde, it can stain their hair. Darker hair, probably not so much a, of a problem. Um, if they're going to use it, tell them, and they're going to wear it to bed. So usually we tell them to put it on at bedtime, just wear old pajamas or pajamas you don't care about getting messed up. And it does smell. It smells like you're doing highway repair in your, <laughs> in your bathroom or bedroom. Um, the other, the other thing it requires is a, a time and place. So with shampoo, it's five to ten minutes. So that may be something people can't do, or you tell them to set a timer. A minute is fast. It's slow in class, and it's slow when you're trying to wait in the shower for the conditioner to do its, do its work. So ADRs, it can cause a folliculitis in certain areas of the body, stain the skin, the hair, photosensitize. Uh, remember, we talked about tar being a uh, photosensitizing agent and a phototoxicity. Same thing here. And an irritant contact dermatitis. That's why we like to keep it just on the lesion. So here is a, I couldn't decide this elbow or knee, but here's a lesion that they put coal tar on. They, they've used the solution and they've painted it on there. And they've done a really good job of just keeping it on the lesion. Um, it can be used all over the body. It doesn't usually cause um, much problem. But usually if you're, the more likely is the larger lesions uh, you can paint it on. But you can see where it can be staining. An old, old remedy that has uh, still may have a place for some patients. The topical retinoids, so that Tazeratine is the uh, Tazerac gel and cream is an option, it's a topical. Again, you see where it says don't exceed more than 20% because of systemic absorption. Uh, use in combination with a topical steroid. Avoid it in pregnancy, we just talked about that. Don't use on unbroken or burnt or sunburned skin. You'll increase systemic absorption and burn like fire. Uh, use a sunscreen to protect the skin because it makes them very photosensitizing. Very expensive, $350 for a grain grain tube is a lot. So you reduce irritation by using it with moisturizers every other day application or with the topical steroid. Again, these are going to be your second and third line. Then the calcineurin inhibitor, inhibitors, these are immunomodulators. Again, the problem with them is they're slower, slower onset. 
So topical, topical tacrolimus or tac, uh, tacrol, uh, tacrolimus, sorry, or tacrolimus um, inhibit the uh, synthesis of inflammatory uh, cytokines. So areas where you can't put steroids, these are a good option. So on the skin or in the intertriginous, this would be good places to think about them. The very bottom, they, the FDA issued an alert more than a decade ago about the increased risk of lymphoma and skin cancers in children who were using these agents. It's a, it was a black box warning. Um, but it has never been, it has never borne out uh, in registries or in long term. So you still may hear people bring it up, but it has really never been shown to be a cause and effect. Then local reactions are listed there. Uh, the car the uh, cell silic acid, uh, the things to remember there is again, not in kids. Uh, don't want to use it in big areas over large areas. Not in liver or kidney. Don't use it with other salicylates. Very same thing you learned two days ago. So just transfer it forward with the warts and the, the calluses. Okay, the last one, next last, last one is anthralin. So anthralin is very similar to the tar. Um, it's very effective. Here's a gal who used it on uh, hair or in her scalp uh, before and after, after two weeks. So very good result. Uh, the problem with it is it will cause a permanent red-brown stain. So it's very it's similar to that in, as the coal tar. If you look on the next page, the, the, it's a little bit unusual of a drug to use. You have to start with a low dose, limited time um, that you've exposed the skin to the lesion to, and then up that over time. So you start with the lowest strength, limited amount of time, what they say, 10 minutes, and then as you build tolerance, you increase the strength and increase the duration of time. This one is where you really want to uh, uh, protect the surrounding skin. So they talk about using zinc oxide or something around the lesion to kind of form a, uh, a circumference that you just stay within the on the lesion. Less effective than vitamin D, but it might be something that it's just another piece of, of equipment in your armamentarium. So it may be for some people that that would work. Uh, maybe it's something like the hair or a limited lesion where nothing else has worked. The ultraviolet light I'm not going to uh, test you on. It's there for completeness sake. Uh, it's mostly so that you're aware and who might uh, be using it. Most of these folks are going to be seeing a dermatologist as well. Um, and so you may not be the person who starts some of the therapy. You may be the person who identifies it. Uh, and you are seeing them back more often than the dermatologist may, so it's good to, to know about all those therapies. Okay, so that's psoriasis. So there's no one particular play, you know, there's no nothing like the hypertension or you know, laid out. It's it's more like diabetes. You start with steroids and then you go from there, depending on the lesion and where it's located and what the patient's willing to do. Questions about psoriasis treatment? I think it's a fascinating, fascinating skin condition. Uh, from the standpoint of just it's the way it presents itself, the treatments, and then all the, the manifestations it has, it is, uh, it's to be respected, I'll say that. Okay. Rosacea, what'd you learn about rosacea? So it's on the face, right? Okay. How many types are there? Four. Four types. We'll go over those. Pardon? There's a T word about dilated or So if Dr. Uh, McNeil was still here, he would tell you he had rosacea. He may have already. Sometimes he'll point things out. But he, he if you think about his face, he, uh, he had a mixed 
Uh, he had phlegmatus on his nose, and then he had some of the, on his bridge, he had a little, few little tea light jet cases. So let's look at the different types, because we treat them differently. So one, two, three, and four. So the four is eyes only. To me, there, it's hard to kind of tell the difference between it and a really dry eye uh, complaint. Uh, but it's, it's limited to the eyes and they're really red. I'll show you some pictures of them. And then the phimatus is just the nose. Y'all are way too young to remember Carl Walden. Does anybody watch old TV programs? <laughs> well, he had a very famous program on probably in the 70s. He was more like a detective. But he's just classic. Uh, Google him, Carl Walden. Uh, classic for that phimatus change to the, the nose. Then there is uh, type 2 to me looks more like um, uh, acne. It's, uh, it's pustule, it's very inflammatory. Uh, and then the, uh, the type 1 is more just a red, red face, red noses. So. so here's the erythematous telangiectatic rosacea. So you can see she's got, um, it's all over her cheeks, nose, chin. She's got a few off to the side. I don't think you can see it here. But she's got those little blood vessels, broken blood vessels. So that telangiectasia. This is a common one. Um, same thing, just a broader view of her cheek. Here's the papular pustular. So to me, this is what it looks like acne. So very inflamed uh, uh, lesions and uh, also covers, can cover the whole face, can involve the nose as well. The phytomus. So you can see they're very disfiguring. So if you ever start to suspect that that's the case, get them into treatment because you can, you can prevent this. And then the last one is the ocular. So they're just around the eyes. Okay. It's important to kind of figure out which one it is because the treatment differs for each of them. So in general measures, let's look at the bottom. They tend to be very prone to flushing and the effects of flushing. So a lot of patient education about skin care. So using gentle soaps again, not using a lot of hot water, moisturizers too, because that skin is really uh, hypersensitive. So the triggers for flushing are down there below. Uh, so hot things, alcohol, anything with that would vasodilate, think that way, those are the the things you would tell them about. Extremes of temperature, sunlight, spicy foods, stressors, medications that vasodilate, uh, menopausal hot flushes will make it, make it worse. So like other things we're trying to figure out triggers, you can have them keep a diary and figure out what are their triggers and then help them to modify or the <coughs> uh, to decrease those, those triggers. Skin care, so frequent skin moisturization, taking care of that skin. Uh, gentle skin cleaning, we talked about that. The soaps that we would uh, recommend for others, same thing here. Uh, avoidance of irritating topical products, so astringents that might be used to clean the face. So these would go to like teenage, maybe more teenage girls that would use it. Uh, chemical exfoliating, we would not want them to go into a facial that they're going to exfoliate. Uh, Using sun protection, so we want them to good, use a good SPF uh, product, at least 30. Um, and then for women, and I guess for men as well, it, you can use cosmetic camouflage. And they've come up with lots of different products now uh, to help uh, because some, to put makeup right on uh, this skin sometimes is very uh, sensitizing. So they've come up with uh, 
what they call green tinted pr products. So if you think about red and is the green or the opposite of the wheel, then the green will tip down the, the red. And it's, it's just impressive to go and look at these. So this young girl, she's so beautiful, and look at what that makeup did. Uh, so that's Clinique's product. There are a whole ton of them now. Um, so uh, CoverGirl has one. Uh, some Maybelline has one. They're all they're over. Most of them are things you can buy pretty inexpensively. Uh, so cover up sticks, tinted bar or tinted uh, cover up. Uh, so these can be applied, and then a makeup can be applied over them as well. So these, they market a lot towards acne uh, and cover up of, of the redness associated with that. Uh, there's green tinted uh, facial powder. I tried to get Dr. McNeil to put them on one time. <laughs> he wouldn't do it. I go, let me just see. He goes, I <laughs> wouldn't play ball. Okay. Um, Oh, it talks about these, uh, under sun protection, it talks about um, using sunscreens that contain protective silicone. So I, uh, I like the Neutrogena products. I think they're more pharmaceutically elegant. It's a term mm -hmm. we use. Um, but I, I think they're, they're good products, um, and they, they go on well. Uh, but one of the, uh, you'll, I just wanted to show you a label so you, you would recognize them. So that dimethicone is one of those silicones. They're actually a binding agent. They bind to the skin and then whatever you put in that product, they will bind that, those products, then to the skin. Um, so that's, they're not a um, sunscreen in themselves. They help to bind the sunscreen to the skin to get better effect and longer effect. Okay. All right, so let's talk about each of the different types and how you would treat them. So the first one that is that type 1, erythematode, telangiectatic, rosacea. Okay, so first line is doing all the things that we just talked about, the avoidance of triggers. And then on the next page, there's pharmacologic therapy. So here, because most of it is that flushing, we're going to use a vasoconstrictor. So to me, that's the easiest way to remember which drug goes with which type. So we want vasoconstrictor. So you can imagine anybody who you would not want on a vasoconstrictor, it would be a contraindication or, or a, a caution in using uh, the drug. So there's one in this, um, in this group, and here's a lady who has used it. She has the type 1, and she used that mere vaso. Um, which is a vaso, topical vasoconstrictor, and you can see the response she had in six hours, so uh, pretty impressive. So the problem is like for people who've got hypertension, um, vascular insufficiency, uh, you don't want them to get it around their eyes because if they have glaucoma or other eye issues, it will influence their, uh, influence that. The other would be in that uh, four, four or five bullets down, uh, cerebral or coronary insufficiency, Raynaud's syndrome, orthostatic hypertension, uh, scleroderma, Sjogren's uh, syndrome. So think cardiovascular disease, think vascular uh, when you're, if you're considering that drug. The other would be to uh, topical oxymetazoline. Uh, this is what's in nasal sprays, so we use the vasoconstrictor to help unstop or if we're all stopped up. Uh, so that is another agent that has been incorporated into uh, a cream. Uh, so again, vasoconstrictors. So think that with the type of one. Comments? Okay. Oh, I guess I did. Okay. So for the papular pustular rosacea, here we're, we do treat a little bit more like um, acne, we use antibiotics. But the antibiotics we use more a lot for their anti-inflammatory effects. So we don't think that way always, but tetracyclines are the mainstay here. If we're going to use an oral agent in the type 2, we use a, a tetracycline. And tetracyclines have, at low doses, have anti-inflammatory effects. 
People have been concerned about the overuse of, of tetracyclines for skin lesions, and so we use a much lower dose of the tetracycline if we're going to use it orally uh, for, um, in this case, for acne and in this type of rosacea. But other agents that are used are metrogel or metronidazole is probably one of the more common ones. It's a little bit less expensive, comes as a gel, very effective. The other is azelaic acid, also a very effective product. Um, consider it first line, uh, it's same as metrogel or the metronidazole. Uh, comes as a cream or lotion, a foam or a gel. Again, it's going on the face of so those vehicles. Makes sense, right? Once a day. The biggest thing is it stings. Uh, the gels probably have got alcohol base, so you might want to look at the different forms uh, depending on patient complaint. Ivermectin. So this one can be used. It's a topical. We, you'll see ivermectin when, when we get to like scabies, lice. Where you can use it orally to uh, kill those little creatures. So here it has anti-inflammatory properties, but it also kills skin mites on your skin that are causing the disease. Isn't that disgusting? Okay. So better tolerated than azelaic acid. Um, so if it, they're having lots of burning with that, can't use the metronidazole for some reason, then uh, the ivermectin. So you've got a variety of things to choose from. So it may be dependent on cost, what the insurance will pay for, what the patient tolerates in terms of their side effects. Other agents are this um, sulfacetamide sulfur or sulfacet, uh, less effective and it stinks. You, so sulfur smell is what? Rotten eggs and it, and it just has an odor. So put coal tar on your head and sulfur on your face, <laughs> nobody will bother you. <laughs> Topical retinoids could be used, but again, they are way down the list in terms of uh, refractory. So those are your topical products. Then the oral tetracyclines are listed there. Uh, so you can use generic tetracycline, doxycycline, or minocycline. Minocycline, is, uh, they're all effective. Minocycline tends to be a little bit more expensive, so you may get pushbacks from the uh, insurance companies when you're using them. You go down to the second bullet, it talks about using lower doses. Uh, there's one that has been uh, approved uh, that is uh, the low dose doxycycline or ratio. Uh, it, expensive. I've seen where pushback where it's like you got to use the other before and, and justify why you would use it, but it is another product out, out there. So treating with uh, for up to 12 weeks and then transitioning. So again, getting it under control and then transition them to a topical product. So again, uh, the bigger things would be their photosensitizing, so keep in mind all the care to take from uh, sun exposure. Uh, don't use them in kids because of the tooth discoloration and decreased bone growth. So very similar to, have y'all had acne? Okay, so the similar type of product should have been talked about in there as well. These are all used maybe in different, under different names for acne. For the ocular rosacea, the recommendation is to refer them to an ophthalmologist, um, especially for the very severe because the, of the products that you're having to use around the eye. So you'll see there that lid scrubs, warm compresses, topical erythromycin, metronidazole, oral tetracyclines, topical uh, cyclosporin, uh, but the recommendation there is to identify it and move them to a specialist. On the top of the next page, the phytomus rosacea. They can use isotretinoids, so the, the retinoids, or for advanced is laser ablation surgical. Recognize it when early and, and get them into therapy. Okay. Questions about those? Okay, we can do this. Okay, how many you all have used sunscreens, right? Yes. Okay. What do you know about sunscreens? I don't put them on your burn. Don't put it on if you don't put it on your burn. Okay. Three out of five. Say it. SPF level. SPF is important, so we'll talk about that. What else? Reapply frequently. Reapply frequently. 
what? <laughs> There's different vehicles. There's different vehicles, different ways you can spray <laughs> lotions, creams. What else? The high SPS don't work better. They're just longer. It's a longer, it's supposed to be a longer um, duration that you can use it. But the recommendations, dermatologists say every two hours reapply regardless. Okay, so SP, uh, sunscreen terminology, MED, minimal erythemal dose. So this is how, this is what they use to calculate that SPF. So it's the minimum dose of ultraviolet radiation that produces a clearly marginated erythema on an irradiated site compared to a non. So it's, they put the product on the skin and they compare it to skin that didn't have the product and they, they measure the difference. So the SPF only tells you about UVB protection. Okay. So if you, in looking there you see that the, the bigger problem for us is the UVA. Okay. So broad spectrum, if it, it, they can use the term broad spectrum if it will cover both. It doesn't say broad spectrum and all you're dealing with is an SPF then you're just getting UVB and that's the more superficial. All right. Next page. They can only use the term water resistant. And they can only do that if it's kind of like food. You know, we talked about all the little labels, things that they can put on foods. Well, this is with on sunscreen. So it's water resistant if the sunscreen will remain effective for 40 to 80 minutes while a person is swimming or sweating. So advice on sunscreen protection. So the, the general recommendation is to use at least an SPF of 15. Dermatologists recommend an SPF of 30 or greater. The worst time of the sun's rays are 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Don't sunbathe, stay out of the sun. Sunscreen should be reapplied every two hours, regardless of the SPF that you have, uh, you're, you're using. <coughs> also, it doesn't work right away. You know, most people apply it and then get in, so it takes 15 to 30 minutes. So, applying it before. Okay, what about on infant use? Don't use them on infants, especially under six months, they recommend, unless you absolutely cannot avoid it. Uh, use, uh, let's see. Okay, so a couple of things. Went on this, do, this uh, dermatologist blog. I like her, she's from Austin. And I love what she does because she said, everybody knows what a jigger is. So she's saying, just visualize that because a jigger full is what you need to put on every two hours. What's a jigger? Uh, okay, alcohol, jigger. A Measure out your alcohol. A shot. A shot. A shot. A jigger, it's also called a jigger. <laughs> Come on. A jigger full? A shot full. I don't know. I just think it's like parallel universes. Okay. So I shot less. I'll, I'll use your link. I can use your Anyway, the recommendation, so a shot glass is what you is a, is something that it, most people have an idea of what how much that is. So it's about two ounces. That's right. She says most people do not apply enough and so applying every two hours. So she said if you're going to be out all day, an eight ounce bottle, which is typical too, is what you should be going through in a day. Oh my God. If you're in the sun all day long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is what she says about sprays. Now, this is just one dermatologist. She doesn't like sprays because she said most people don't apply it enough. 
and it, you would have to stand there and really cover it. And she doesn't think they stay on as well. So her recommendation was stay away from sprays. But they're out there, but she said be sure you do a, a good application of them. So I don't have an equivalency for you, but I'm glad you brought the point up. Yeah. Uh, for like normal skin people, can you apply like uh, sunscreen from the body to the face? Or do you have to have different face sunscreen? Not that I, yeah, it's a good question. Not that I know of. I've never seen it that says you need to put on different parts of the skin different. I don't know that. It's a good question though. Really good. Mostly you just want to get it on all the exposed skin. Uh, so you've got clothing, so look underneath, so the clothing, so clothing will protect you, there's UV clothing as well, um, I put it in there about wet clothes do not protect you as well as dry clothes, so if you're out on the river, uh, may not get as good protection. Ingredients, so this is, this is important at the top of the next page. So you want to look for a sunscreen that is both a physical barrier and a chemical barrier. Your physical barriers are the ones that will protect you against UA, UVA. So that's the zinc oxide and the titanium dioxide. So that's the ones that leave the white residue. All the others, um, I listed them there for you. So PABA, uh, salicylate, cinnamates, uh, benzophenones, those are your sunscreen ingredients. They will protect you against UVB. And they are the ones that your SPF is related to. Okay. So look for one that has both. Now the PABA is very structurally related to sulfonamides and sulfonamides. And so if people are sensitive to sulfonamides, they may be sensitive to PABA. So I have, an, I have allergies to sulfonamides. When I put PABA on, I just get a rash everywhere. So I still will use it, but I keep it off my neck and my face. The rest of my body seems to be able to tolerate it, but my neck and my face cannot tolerate it. Uh, so keep that in mind if people complain about, you can get PAPA-free uh, sunscreens. Uh, cancer protections, this is important. Regular use does help prevent melanoma. Regular use of just a, an SPF 16 sunscreen for five years reduced the risk of melanoma by in the next 10 years by 50%. That's big. So we talked about people who might wear a lot of sunscreen, probably get less vitamin D. So if, uh, for people who always cover up, um, like a Bethany or a, a Paul, who probably <laughs> never want sunlight to hit them very much, then you need to worry about their vitamin D. Wasn't that a lovely way to spin from three to five? Yes. yes. I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs>